Welcome to the Forever Classic Podcast, the show seeking enlightenment through video games, films, and other geek culture. I'm Alex McCumbers, and I'm here with uh, our good pal Nathan Marshand. Hey, oh, except now it's a little bit weird because now I'm doing this OOC. I'm out of character. Yeah, this is not <laughs> MIFV Nate. This is real Nate. It's just regular <laughs> old Nate. Regular old Nate. Yeah, the, uh, it's uh, yeah. Which I quite <laughs> it's like. like it's regular Pepsi. It's not you know fancy Pepsi or you know Pe- Pepsi One or vanilla or whatever. They but do everybody nowadays. on my show is well aware of Nathan, a upstanding citizen, kaiju expert. <laughs> And about, I don't know, probably two or three years ago, you were at G-Fest and you messaged 2019, me. 2019, that was the last time frenzy. the show happened. Yep. Yeah, and you messaged me in a frenzy, dude. You're like, you have <laughs> got to see this indie game. <laughs> I don't know yes. when it's coming out, but this is this is right up your alley. And then I was like, okay, cool. I'll put it on my list of things to watch. Granted, that's a, a list of like a thousand games, right? Because I'm yes. just interested in anything and everything all at once. Also a great movie. Uh, but the thing is with this particular game is it was eventually picked up for publishing by way forward Mm -hmm. which always says a lot to me because way forward doesn't miss they almost (laughs) always make a game that's at least good so today we have with us the creative director of dawn of the monsters at 13 a.m games we have alex First of all, welcome to the show, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's uh, it's great to be here. It is super cool because we're just really enjoying Dawn of the Monsters. For anybody unaware, if you want to go check out a trailer, that'd be great. But it is a beat-em-up that really celebrates kaiju culture, and you play as mm-hmm. various kaiju representations of the varying themes. Oh, yeah, the yeah. They, and it's really cool. There are characters that... I don't I, I I wouldn't call them well one of them I would call a pastiche but th- they fill the different archetypes you would expect to see in kaiju and tokusatsu in yeah, they're uh, in this game there's yeah, a tribute style character, anyways. there's a Godzilla, there's a, a Gamera kind of thing. There's Except a it's mech. a crab. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a really fun time, so I highly recommend you all check this out. It's got a great combat system to it. And so the first thing that I kind of want to ask Alex here is, how did Dawn of the Monsters kind of come about? What was the spark, the primordial soup that led to these creatures? <laughs> well, uh, I, I've, I've always loved kaiju ever since i was a little kid I've, I've been obsessed and i always wanted to make a kaiju video game and a few years ago so my my studio 13 am games we we released our first game in 2015 uh, and it was called runbo and it's also available on just about everything under the sun and after that game we had started developing an early prototype for a kaiju fighting game and unfortunately, we couldn't get that work, you know, like funded. We couldn't get it completed. So we shifted gears. We put that on the back burner and we went with a different project, which ended up becoming Double Cross, which we released in 2019. And then once we released that, we needed to get started on another project. We came back to the Kaiju concept, but we thought, wouldn't this be more fun if it was cooperative? Because with fighting games, you know, once I get good at a fighting game, and I have a friend over, we can't really play it together because like either I have to play with one arm tied behind my back or they have to have a really bad time. So we wanted to to make something that you can enjoy with a friend, even if one of you is really good and one of you is really bad. And we looked and we realized that, you know, Kaiju are, are awesome. Uh, co-op beat-em-ups are awesome. Why hasn't anyone put those two together in a video game? And uh, that's kind of how it got started. And it seems like there's like a really hungry market right now for beat 'em ups because we saw the success of things like Streets of Rage 4. There's a lot of the, the classic titles being ported to Switch. There's River City Girls, which is getting a sequel now and has kind of spawned into its own like little mini franchise. Was beat 'em up something that you guys just like had a, an additional passion for? Like, are there particular games that you consider like standout favorites? I've always loved beat 'em ups myself. And and this goes for not just how I view the genre, but also how we looked at it when we were developing this game. But I don't just like 2D beat-em-ups. I also really love 3D beat-em-ups. So on the 2D side, like I grew up playing Streets of Rage mm-hmm. um, and Final Fight. I really love Sengoku 3 and the Neo Geo. That's a really fun one. And when it comes to 3D beat-em-ups, like I, I really love Ninja Gaiden. I really mm-hmm. love Bayonetta. And I'm a big fan of Dynasty Warriors. So those all kind of are like some of my, I don't know, some of the games I've sunk the most time into. And I mean, even stuff like Monster Hunter is kind of a beat-em-up, I guess. 
you're just beating on one monster for a long time. And I've, I've sunk a lot of time into that. Yeah, I can see that. Now, in, Alex can attest to this because when we were playing, we were making commentary on a lot of the gaming influences. I was pointing out all, all of your guys's kaiju and toku references but one uh, when i was playing I, I was definitely seeing where the fighting game influence was in this because i am an avid fighting game player and uh, i will uh, i love the fact that it wasn't just because as much fun as say streets of rage 4 is it's still very much an old school style game where you basically mash one button until you win Nothing against that. That's just how it works. You need to have a bit more finesse to play Dawn of the Monster. So it made the fighting game fan in me very happy to get to a point where I'm like, okay, I need to figure out this game's combat system if I'm going to advance in the game. I was actually telling Alex that, well, uh, McCumbers. I have to say, like, <laughs> yeah, you can rush <laughs> in McCumbers now because yeah. I'm the yeah. I'm the one not Alex in this chat. Yeah. Give it time. But yeah, you know, but uh, I when I got to uh, as uh, Agnator, the penultimate boss, that boss kicked the crap out of me for so long, and then <laughs> I kept looking at my all the augs I had. I even told that uh, I even told McCumbers, I'm like, I have two options. I can backtrack and get more augs, or I'm just going to take the augs I already have and figure out how to be beat his big kaiju keister his hot kaiju keister with this because he's a lava monster oh so i just i figured it out it involved me figuring out how to time perfect dodges and parries mm. and things like that and then i won we can certainly nice. see that fighting game influence while we were playing and and so like is that a similar reaction that you've got to players because the game's been out for about a month or two now like are, are you seeing people come to this and being like oh i recognize that there's fighting game bones here yeah yeah I, honestly even from like some of the trailers people were commenting like oh this looks like it has kind of like you know fighting game combos and special moves and cancels. I mean, the fact that we have kind of like a, a canceling hierarchy where you can cancel a normal attack into a heavy attack, into a special, into a super is very fighting game inspired. And yeah, a lot of people have picked up on that. Yeah, which is why I'm, I was delighted to see that you guys included a training mode because I will just go in there. I was just like, can I string all these together? And then I do like, oh my gosh, it worked. That was a really <laughs> fun moment in our gameplay session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to have the lab, right? You got to be able to, to see, see what you're capable of, right? Yeah, or see what the game will let you do. It was really starting to approach it like it was a fighting game. So I'm like, okay, what can I do in the corner? <laughs> wait, wait, you get over here. Uh, can this work outside the corner? No, it can't. But what can I do outside the corner? <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I was flipping out when I was realizing I could literally uh, like basically use every single button and every single kind of move in one combo. I was flipping out because I'm like, I can go light, light, light strong dash special cataclysm I'm like i just did that nice. it was really yeah, cool to yeah. see like all the damage stack up but um so one of the things that's kind of interesting is like if this started as a fighting game and has been in development for a long time it leads me to believe that you probably left a lot on the cutting room floor so what was that iterative process kind of like to create dawn of the monsters in the form that we see it now uh well we there was a lot um, because it was also our studio's first kind of combat focused action game that our previous two titles were platformers. So there were a lot of prototypes. So there was the initial fighting game prototype and that was kind of a small arena that you could play in, fight one other person. And then that kind of evolved into something with a little more intense destructible environments and you fighting multiple enemies and, you know, at one point you could jump in the game and we ended up pulling that out because and not only did it look kind of weird because like these heavy monsters were like flying across the screen. We, we found it more satisfying to have the ground based dodge so you could just dodge through stuff mm -hmm. if you needed to get out of the way, which, which was also kind of like inspired by God of War. Sorry. Oh, OK. It feels kind of Dark Souls. -y okay. To me. Like the, the just the 
kind of like hitting things with your face, but using your iframes in a very aggressive, like just stick close to your opponent kind of way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's funny. I, I had a friend of mine who had never played Dark Souls or any FromSoft game, but he played Dawn of the Monsters and... After playing Dawn of the Monsters, he started playing Elden Ring and was like, oh, like Dawn taught me how to how to like dodge out of the way of stuff and like when to block and when to parry. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden he's doing all right in Elden Ring because mm -hmm. Dawn kind of taught him those, those fundamentals. Yeah. Well, I was actually finding some amusing things to do with the with the combat system. Like I figured out that I can do dash attack, cancel into and then cancel into a regular dash so I could actually kind of. It's almost like wave dashing, but it only in short spurts. So I can get a little bit of extra speed, which is handy in some levels when you want to get out of the way of obstacles like tidal waves. Yeah, yeah. There's some stuff you can do there. There's also some like super hidden secret tech that we left in the game that players are like starting to unravel. Um, that's like not listed in the manual or whatever, but. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Okay. I was yeah, you can get pretty nuts. anything that people hadn't found yet, because I love when developers hide things and you don't have to reveal anything in this chat, obviously. But is there anything that you're really surprised people haven't found yet? Uh, Aside from the, like, really minute, like, mechanical details? Well, I'll say this. There's, and I haven't seen, like, I haven't tried to catalog what everyone has and hasn't found. But there are so many Easter eggs in the game. Like, just a... <sighs> A lot of, you know, even even the smallest references, winks and nods to things. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, there are some that people still haven't picked up on, but I was surprised at how many people have picked up on. Because a lot of these are like super deep pulls for <laughs> ultra kaiju nerds. Like someone noticed, someone in Japan noticed that Eiji, who's Aegis Prime's like human form, Eiji was born in Sukagawa, and that's where Eiji Tsuburaya is born. Oh, so, really? Like, somebody, I didn't notice that. I picked yeah. up on it. I picked up on his name, but I didn't pick up on the birthplace. Yeah. So, you know, I was surprised at what people have picked on because I was like, I, that was just like the smallest little in joke that I put in there to see if someone would notice and someone did. So we're all very into tokusatsu and kaiju and everybody involved with this game, I assume, is just as nerdy about this as we are. So that's just fun because we don't get that a lot in games. Yeah, honestly, even even in like and like I, I love games like like War of the Monsters or, um, uh, you know, Godzilla Save the Earth or whatever and Star Monsters Melee and, and they do have some neat easter eggs but because those games didn't have super intense stories there wasn't always a lot to like cling on to in those worlds you know what i mean mm -hmm. so it was really fun as a kaiju fan to be like okay i get to make a brand new world of kaiju yeah and stuff it to the gills with all the stuff i love mm -hmm. and i think people are kind of resonating with that that actually was the most surprising thing for me when i actually played the game which was just you know for we'll call it a budget game and for you know uh, uh and a beat -em up a beat -em up that looks really cool i love the art style and we'll talk a bit about the art style but i was expecting something closer to a streets of rage 4 i thought it was going to be pretty straightforward simple story beat the game and hour and a half or something like that and then it it turned into basically this kind of like 12 hour saga <laughs> with a surprise chapter i wasn't expecting mm. so but the i say all of that to say there is a lot of lore in this game the characters are very well developed and uh, you know there's uh, there's a lot of interactions between them you have voice acting which i wasn't expecting voice acting I, that surprised me a little bit uh, basically what i'm saying is there's a lot of production value in this game much more so than i was expecting and i really appreciate that and in terms okay. of you know uh, like deep cut easter eggs i don't know if you if this was the if I pointed this out when we streamed together, McCumbers, but my favorite one is Goro Maki. <laughs> I felt like I, I have, you have to be a hardcore fan to pick up on that one because yeah. it's so throwaway. But I'm like, Goro Maki, I know that one. <laughs> That's the name of several characters in Godzilla films. For whatever reason, Toho just likes that name. But I think the most direct, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the the one of those Goro Makis that you're most directly referencing is the one from Shin Godzilla, correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely the chief inspiration. But also just I, I knew from the get-go I needed to have that name in the game somewhere. I feel like there's a checklist that you've been building for the past, like, <laughs> three or four years of, like, okay, here's all the things that I want to, like, point at and be like, I like Absolutely. this. Absolutely. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, because uh, you know, I I caught on to a uh, AG. Uh, I caught on to uh, Jamila. I actually yeah. pointed that out on your on our stream, McCumbers. I said, oh yeah, that character. <laughs> he, she's named after an Ultra Kai. She's like, who? Huh? She's named after an Ultra Kai. Yeah, really weird one too. <laughs> yeah, we we had a lot of fun just like googling various things. But Alex, what is the the like piece of this development that you're most proud of? Whether that be like a story bit or getting a design to really come together, like what really kind of stands out to you? I think what's most satisfying to me, like obviously there's a lot of things, right? Especially from a high level. And like as a creative director, I mean, the most satisfying thing is seeing all these pieces come together. But I think what, like if I get really granular with it, something that I'm really satisfied with is the the feeling of the combat, which was something that took a while for us to get, especially with some someone like Megadon for example, is Megadon is this big lumbering beast, but we decided pretty early on that, you know, he wasn't fun to control if he was actually sluggish and slow. So we wanted him to feel like he's slow because he's giant, but we wanted him to actually control kind of responsive and, uh, and fast. So, you know, things like his heavy hold attack, we have to hold down the button and he winds up and then he punches and it causes an explosion. Those are just really satisfying things to, to pull off and to watch people do. Uh, executions as well. People really like ripping things heads off or, you know, punching them in the gut and blowing them up. So <laughs> there's a few of those enemies where uh, I don't think it's going for the gut. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really He's going for something. He, Me- Megadon doesn't play around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he goes for the foot. But uh, no, that's really cool that the fact that you like keep the action going by allowing you to get health through aggression, which is like a tactic that Doom has used and a lot of games have figured out. Yeah, that, like, it, it makes a lot of sense when you yeah. want to be a very action driven game. But it seemed like a lot of the animation and sound effects and like all of that was fine tweaked to really sell the visual language of Kaiju. And I think you guys just nailed it. Like it. Thank you, man. It's very it, comparable yeah. to something of like Pacific Rim where it's like all in the mm-hmm. visual language of mm-hmm. how things move, where the impact is and what sound effect is associated with that to make it mm-hmm. feel like these things are a lot larger than they like, actually are, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that was a big and- influence for us too, a big, a big touchstone Pacific Rim. That's a good oh, one. Oh, well, Pacific Rim's a big influence on basically anybody and everybody who's <laughs> who's doing anything kaiju related these days. But yeah, actually going back to Doom, the, there were points I did feel like I was playing a modern Doom game where I couldn't just run in and just like when I'm playing uh, Doom 2016, I can't just run in and just shoot everything. You have to be strategic. You got to know where are the enemies, how do they behave, what weapons work best against them. So you have to do that in Dawn of the Monsters where you have to figure out the combo system. You got to figure out, OK, how do these enemies behave? This one doesn't take any damage until it attacks and then it exposes this jewel looking thing. Then I can damage it. Otherwise, it's going to take nothing. So how do I do that? Well, I'm either going to have to dodge out of the way when it attacks or I have to block and then I retaliate. You can't just go Mm. in and just start swinging at it until you beat the game and then go back to the old levels with the big (laughs) augs and then you just one shot everything. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, then you can just kind of mash away. Monster mash. Yeah, it's it's good you bring that up because that's something that a lot of people who play the game, they go, oh, I'm definitely feeling, you know, fighting games and different beat-em-ups and different action games. But uh, Doom was actually a big influence on the development as well because the way that they design enemies in Doom is they, they keep them very distinct with very distinct patterns of behavior. And so you have to go into a room and you have to prioritize who do you kill first and why. And that was something that we thought was uh, Mm -hmm. key, you know, enemy prioritization and all that kind of stuff is uh, Mm -hmm. super important in an action game. Mm -hmm. And something that I really appreciate is the AUG system, which is I remember when you were at G-Fest, because this is this is something we should mention. I was there at G-Fest when you announced the development of this game. I was in that room and I was excited by what I was seeing and I've been following it very closely ever since. And one of the things that. Yeah. They, oh, yeah. Because you talked about it being like an RPG system. And I thought, OK, that's kind of fine. And I've played some beat em ups that have a level up system. You you unlock more moves with the characters as you level them up. You don't really do that. You get what the way this works is that each monster, each character has its own base stats and then you get the augs and the augs are all different levels, but they all have different properties that affect the stats. So you're not leveling up the monster so much as you're finding better equipment. And that is far more interesting to me because then you have to start making decisions like, okay, 
do I want to go? Do I want to just get these higher level augments that are going to max out my stats so I can, you know, have more defense and offense and stuff like that? Or do I want to try to get the the special abilities on the augs to stack so they all play into each other? So it's like mm. here's three different augs that all go with that all pertain to a certain mechanic, like executions. Like you know, you you every time you do an execution, you get rage. Performing executions gives you cataclysm meter. You know things like that, so they kind of stack on each other. It really it starts to make you have to make decisions, and like I said before. When you know that there's a boss fight coming up, you have you start thinking differently. It's like I need different augs depending on what kind of a situation I'm going in. Am I going into one where there's going to be a bunch of smaller monsters that I need to fight? Well, let's use these. These are better for crowd control. Oh wait, no, I'm a bo- I'm going up against the boss. Time to make a boss slayer loadout. You know, <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, and set it up there because some augs don't work well against individual monsters like bosses. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say it. When it comes to that system, one of the biggest influences for me and, and, and kind of why we wanted to do it that way was Monster Hunter, where in Monster Hunter, you don't level up your character. You build equipment and you build different armor sets that have different skills and abilities. And I always found that a little more satisfying because like there'd be a reason to swap stuff out. And I don't know, I, I you know, I, I love RPGs of different kinds, but sometimes, you know, leveling up and just getting a little stronger, like, oh, you do a little more damage now, doesn't really change how I play. Uh, and so we wanted to make sure that the system would encourage you to, yeah, do those things. So you're swapping out augments, you're thinking about the builds that you're making, um, and you're changing them throughout the game, and they're changing how you play depending on how you like to play. Like when I play Monster Hunter, I usually build a crit damage build. I just try to get as much crit damage and crit crit percentage as possible because I just enjoy doing that. And then, you know, I might build different sets for different monsters or whatever, but I can kind of tune it to my play style. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm a huge fan of Monster Hunter. It's something we talk about on the show constantly. And mm-hmm. when World came out, we were obsessed. Oh, it's a great game. The, what's fun about about the augs in this game is I've played, oh, geez, I think I've sunk at least 15 hours, if not more, into the game already, and I'm still finding new augs. Nice. I don't know how many total augs there are in the game, but I'm still finding new ones. Yeah, I think there's like, I want to say there's like 35 or 40 augments. Somewhere That's impressive. There. Now, speaking and of they all pl- and making... Uh, little adjustments are there any particular tweaks that you're either hoping to implement soon or something that you wish you would have included in the initial design um there are some tweaks that we're we're gonna make i mean we we are working on patches and updates you know some some quality of life things some tweaks like uh for example on switch performance mode and rumble a bunch of bug fixes and stuff like that for the most part i think things turned out pretty well but i think the number one thing i would like to do is i'd love to to make um dlc for the game for something like a post game mode so that once you're once you've completed and once you've s ranked everything there's still something that you can keep playing mm. yeah that's something can we I'd love to do can we expect not only to see new modes but maybe some you know, some new levels or maybe some new characters that yeah, it would all be great yeah if, if if we can do it, like if we can, you know, if the game makes enough money and we can get together and do the the DLC, those are all things that I think would be awesome additions. Is there mm-hmm. like a, like if you guys were approved of three DLC characters, they're like one in particular, like style of character that you would really, really want to do? You know, it's hard to say. We've been because like there are. We really only ever considered four characters. There was a fifth at one time that was kind of a stone golem character, but Pretty early on, we decided we wanted to do a Godzilla-style kaiju, an insect kaiju, a mecha, and a and an Ultraman-type hero. So we were like, okay, we want to hit like the four main quadrants of giant monster action. Mm-hmm. And then for the fifth, it's like, well, I'm not sure. Um, something that our fans have mentioned a few times is like they want to see a, a kind of uh, Simeon or King Kong yep um type right. creature uh, another recommendation we saw was like a uh like a big like an ultra woman or like a female like a giant woman warrior mm-hmm. like a like a 50 foot woman like yeah, attacking like the 50 yeah maybe like, like 50 foot woman or something. or something that'd be kind of fun uh, I, I was I, I had one in mind i was trying to uh it, you could try getting a maybe doing something a little unorthodox and maybe make it like you know like an actual flying monster like a mothra or a quadruped like a like an Mm. agoris or like kind of play around see if it would fit within the angel yeah Yeah. 
Well, actually, someone yeah. someone in our Discord like designed a, a, a kaiju called Tempestra, which is like a flying kind of dragon monster. Oh, cool! That uh, there's so many ideas, and honestly, there there hasn't been like one so far where I'm like, oh yeah, that's the obvious choice. Besides maybe the the ape, but I don't know. I'd love to maybe I mm-hmm. I, I got to think more about it and and see what people what ideas people uh, might have at the studio. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I keep thinking I had another one in mind that I thought would be kind of interesting i'm not actually dime machine come. is it a dime machine dime machine yes that's yeah. it you know like a dime machine one so you could have like basically a giant samurai type yeah. character and oh okay yeah 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 yeah, yeah. and then uh, you can actually kind of play around with the uh, with the rage system because dime machine you know is you know he's a he's an angry you know <laughs> uh, this angry god statue you know so he's it's like rage yeah he's filled with rage so like you can kind of maybe put it in a mechanic where like he has a special interaction with the rage meter like he maybe his stats boot up a little bit the more rage he has or oh, something that like that so there could be a little bit of a trade-off so that you want to build rage but you still want to use the rage attack so it forces the player to make decisions about like do i want the stat boost or do i want the big moves <laughs> that's that's it that's a pretty cool idea i hadn't even i honestly didn't even think of damage until i was sitting in here with you guys so yeah, yeah. yeah. Knows? or uh maybe his cataclysm could be a massive buff or something like that like yeah, boost all of his stats like crazy. Huh? Speaking of fan interaction, I mean we we've already mentioned just hanging out with us is kind of a fan interaction, right? Do you find fan interactions like helpful in the development process? Because I know a lot of developers are really kind of in this world, right, where they introduce their project, they like foster a little community, and that community is where they like steadily kind of in in a giant collective help make the game better and help people like stay connected. Like, do you find that useful as a developer? Oh, yeah. I, I, I wish we could have done more. I mean, you know, spoilers, but we, we were supposed to be at GFest 2020. Yep, <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and 2021. And, and right from the outset, we unveiled Dawn of the Monsters at GFest 2019. And we immediately started to survey people there and ask questions and get feedback. So even from an early stage of the project, we wanted to, because like ultimately this, this game is for fans by fans. And we want to make sure that, that those people enjoy it more than anyone else. Like, like really, really, you know, right. sometimes when, when you make a game, it can be hard to satisfy both hardcore fans of something and like casual fans. And we were like, we want to focus on hardcore mm-hmm. kaiju fans and make sure that they're happy. And hopefully everyone else is going to enjoy it as well. But mm-hmm. like if our core audience isn't happy, then we wouldn't be doing right. So I love it. Yeah, I remember you were actually taking requests from people. I think at the time when you announced the game in 2019, I think the only stage that you had for sure uh, that you knew for sure you were going to do was Toronto. The yeah. other cities and locations hadn't been decided yet, and you were actually asking people. And me being a born and raised Hoosier boy, I walked up there and said, "Like, how about you use Indianapolis, the capital of oh, my yeah. state?" And you're like, oh, yeah, are there any good landmarks there? It's like, yeah, have the monsters trash the speedway. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> I remember that, actually. I remember that. <laughs> so I will confess, when I was playing the game, I'm like, is it there? <laughs> if you ever want to okay. do a, a West Virginia-style cryptid beat em up call me. <laughs> That's where I'm from. Hey, hey, we got a fun, we got a, there's a fun cryptid God, not too far idea. from where Hang I on. live. I'm going to write that shit down. That's, that's too good. <laughs> that's funny. Go ahead, Nathan. Uh, I was just saying, I've got a, I've got a, a fun little cryptid uh, not too far from where I live right now. The Beast of Busco. <laughs> it's a giant turtle named Oscar. He lives in a lake. You should Google me that wow. later because I'm actually taking a cryptid road trip in May and oh. I might drive through your state, so that would be fine. To so, uh, come to Busco and learn about Oscar? Sure. I even know a guy. I even know a guy who did a comedic, who wrote a comedic stage play about it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> huh. Yeah. So we we did kind of touch on the future plans. I mean, obviously, probably one of the biggest things you guys got going on, Alex, is the limited run release. And what's that? Which I bought. Like? I basically <laughs> bought it in a heartbeat. <laughs> nice. I'm still waiting for it to come in, though. <laughs> it, it'll take some time. It'll take some time. Because one cool thing about limited run is, so they take those pre-orders and then they manufacture. And so if there's like, I don't know if this has happened to you before, but sometimes I'll, I'll buy a game and then the game will might, might have glitches or bugs and it has to get patched. Right. And so you got to download the patch for the game. But sometimes like, I don't know, on like certain platforms, once those servers go down, you can no longer download that patch. And so your physical copy is kind of useless with an internet connection, which kind of defeats the, 
the purpose of, of, you know, just being able to own it and not worry about that. So, so yeah, L- limited run is nice in that they'll actually make sure that any of the patches that we're doing are going to be included in on the cart. So, mm. or, or disc or whatever it is. So that'll be like, you know, the final ultimate version of the game. But yeah, working with limited run is, has been great. I mean, they basically said yes to whatever idea we had, even down to the point of like, hey, can we make small figures of all four yes. of the main characters? And they were like, yeah, sure, let's do it. Yep. Uh, speaking of figures, we uh, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about Seismic Toys. You guys have been partnering with them basically as soon as you announced the game because you had the Megadon figures at G Fest in 2019, and I was yeah. like, I want one, but I don't have money, and now I have two Megadons sitting on my <laughs> shelf, <laughs> posing with all of the rest of my collection. They say money can't <laughs> buy happiness, but money did buy Nathan a Megadon, and he seems pretty happy to me. Uh, yeah, I, I have like a fact, it. actually, I need to tell you guys, you guys picked such a great company to work with, with Seismic, because they, one of my favorite all-time favorite interactions with any company happened with seismic which is because i missed the the initial megadon i got the blue one. Oh yeah and i was like I, the, actually the whole time i was playing dawn i'm like where's the blue megadon i want the blue megadon he does show up you you can't unlock that skin i know i have un- i've unlocked all the skins nice nice <laughs> I have unlocked all the skins. And let me tell you, the Easter eggs and the skins made me very happy. (laughs) (laughs) Some of them are not even tokusatsu related. They're video game related. I'm like, oh, I see what you did there. (laughs) But anyway, uh, so I missed the first one. And I really wanted that initial one because I love the default color scheme. Orange and red, it's, it looks so great. And I'm very fond of those colors. So I saw a post that went up on Seismic's, it was uh, on Seismic's Instagram, and they were using one of the blue Megadons as kind of like a little mascot for a while on their post. And so I just kind of randomly put in there, it's like, hey, I have the blue one. If you guys ever do another run of the, you know, of the red one, the original red one, I'll buy it. They DM'd me within, I think, an hour and said, hey, we have one left. You want it? <laughs> you know, that 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 might have been me because I <laughs> I, I run Seismic circle. with Holy Chris crap. Olio. We, we, <laughs> we co-own it. And I, I remember that because there was someone who because the, the original, the classic Megadon sold out pretty quickly, which was surprising. So I was like, this game isn't even out yet, guys. But, you know. Hey, I'm happy that you want the toys. And then there were a couple that were like tucked away in storage. And I think there was one that someone had said, hey, can you hold this for me? And then they never claimed it. And so when I saw that message, I was like, this guy wants it. You know, he's here. <laughs> so yeah, that is great. true. I keep forgetting that you run seismic. <laughs> well, I'm glad. I'm glad that you like it. I'm glad that you. Uh, I, I was you so happy. And I, I was taking pictures and posting them up and having like I have a, a an SH figure arts Ultraman and I was having him hang out with all with Megadon. And <laughs> yeah, those are great. And I, I try to remember I, I'm looking it up right now. There was one time, I think, where a Megadon was on eBay, but that, like I've only seen one on eBay and I've seen Ganera show up on Mandarake, but it was sold out. So a lot of the times when people do get the figures, they they so far have seemed to just hold on to them. Well, uh, they're limited run and, you know, it's they're not it's not like you can just walk into any collectible store and get it. Yeah, it's certainly a unique story behind these things. And I think that's kind of the the general like big takeaway of this conversation and the fact that you guys like made this super cool kaiju game for kaiju fans with just a lot of heart is this stuff brings us a lot of joy. Like the tokusatsu genre, giant monsters, there's so much more than big than dudes being goofy in rubber suits. It's so mm-hmm. much more than that. And like mm-hmm. as we can tell, it's got a cultural impact and it's really important. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm just I'm really thankful that oh. I live in a world where this stuff exists and it's good and it's fun. Yeah, uh, okay. I'm on the seismic website right now, just looking up some stuff, and I'm like, Ragnar looks amazing. Why is Ragnar not in the game? Ragnar <laughs> looks like a Dawn of the Monsters character. Doesn't he? Maybe Ragnar could join the join the squad. <laughs> we need the that, I would buy line. that DLC in a harpy. He looks perfect. I mean, he's gay. Camera with a Gatling gun arm. Yeah, what's that not to like? He rules, and and that's from the the I think they're on Instagram. Last Bastion Studios, also known as like the Ragnar Squad, is I think that might be it a separate Instagram for them. But yeah, they they make those, and Chris and I saw those at a show, and we were just like, 
this is amazing. We have to make an exclusive with you guys. And mm-hmm. so we got that side hey, I, one. Hey, cut him a deal. See if you can get the character and put him in the game. I'd buy yeah, it. I'd yeah. buy, I think you could do some fun things with that. You know, I, you know, like do some fun stuff with the Gatling arm. Just try to make him a little bit different than Tempest Galahad. Yeah. I think you'll have a on, lot of opportunity. Just the idea of doing beat him up as a Kaiju thing. And then making it unique, but have it like be tributing to the old stuff and the good stuff. Like that's a really powerful brand to me. And so I really hope that you guys get the opportunity for DLC and sequels and maybe like some different toys and really cool, like Mm -hmm. various collectibles. Like I hope it goes the nine yards for you Mm because I really enjoy this type of thing. Mm -hmm. It looks like for anyone who's interested, it does look like Arctic Blast Megadon and the original Ganera are still available, and there is a Ganera variant that is available as well. Yeah, yeah, they're getting pretty low, but yeah, they're they're all still there. Since we are on this toy um, thing, I mean, what's it like making and distributing toys? Because we have brought on uh, the people of Symbiote Studios before for an interview on Forever Classic Games, and we talked about like their process of making mostly plushies. But what's it? What's the process look like for vinyls? Uh, well, it's interesting. I, you know, it's, it's funny with seismic. It was kind of made honestly as, as a kind of a running gag, like Chris Olio and I, we started to sell some of our unwanted kaiju stuff. Like I had a bunch of Godzilla stuff and Ultraman stuff that I didn't want anymore. Cause I was kind of focusing my collection and Chris did as well. And we were like, well, instead of trying to sell these online or whatever, why don't we just bring them to G-Fest, get a table, and to make it worth our while, we could probably buy someone else's old collection they're getting rid of and try to sell that at a table too. Because if you if you can find someone's entire collection, you can usually get a pretty good deal. And then, you know, the toys don't have to be crazy expensive when you resell them. We started doing that, and we had always mentioned like, oh man, it, one of these days we're going to make a toy. We're going to figure it out and we're going to make a toy. And... We hadn't figured out how to do it, and we had been selling at G-Fest for, at that point, a couple of years. And uh, as soon as I knew I was making this kaiju game, I reached out to Chris and I said, hey, I want to show you something. What if we made a toy of this guy? And he was like, that's a great idea. So we, you know, the, the process is basically that you need to come up with a design for the toy. You need to get it sculpted. You need to prototype it. And then you need to get it, you know, cast and uh, molded in, in, in soft vinyl, assembled and painted. So we handle the design and 3D modeling here. Uh, we've, we've so far, we've been working with Mike Lambert, who actually worked on Dawn of the Monsters as an animator, but he also does great 3D modeling work. And then we work with a studio in uh, Hong Kong who does the prototyping manufacturing and painting and packaging and then they ship it over to us so it's a longer process than you would expect sometimes it takes between five and seven months from like concept to completion but there's nothing quite as satisfying as seeing something you you kind of materialize in your mind actually materialize in your hands and be able mm-hmm. to hold it it's pretty cool yeah well and then the the case of megadon people are getting the toy yeah you know, in some cases three years before the game was out and the fact that you were selling out for a game that was just announced nobody knew exactly when it was when it was coming down the pipeline pipeline i mean <laughs> it's kind of a brilliant marketing something. thing in a way because you have these like you know, toy people that will post pictures on Instagram and Twitter and such. And inevitably somebody's going to say, well, what's that guy? I've never seen that one before. And then yeah, like, oh, from? this indie mm-hmm. game called Dawn of the Monsters that I saw at G-Fest mm-hmm. or whatever. And mm-hmm. that just immediately creates organic like growth. And that's really cool. So Nathan, mm-hmm. do you I have think any it's closing uh, thoughts for for our guest here today. Oh, for me, uh, me? Yeah, because I we should probably uh, wrap this up. We're yeah, we uh, we probably should. I just wanted to bring up the, the one last thing about you know the fact that the toys have been selling as well as as I think that's a testament to your uh, to your creature design and really your uh, your art design as well. You talked about that in 2019 as well. There's a very much a, a comic book style to this particularly if, if you're familiar with the hellboy comics by mike magnolia i think mm. the the art style is very conducive to what you're doing with this and it makes it very appealing the stylization and so i think that it, this it's a very visually appealing game as well like i said i i have when i played the game for anybody who's on the fence about getting it 
I can't say it enough. You need to get this game. Yeah, support indie developers, but this is one that has a lot of love and a lot of care and a lot of talent. That's the thing. So this had a lot of times with stuff like this, you might have a lot of love, but not a lot of talent, or you have a lot of talent, but not a lot of love. This has both. And I can't recommend this game enough. I have friends who are may not necessarily be Kaiju fans, but I think they would love playing a game like this. Thank you very much. That, that, that means a lot. Very cool. Thank you so much for being here, Alex. If people wanted to find you on the internet specifically, where would you want to send people? Well, I've got my Twitter is at Goji underscore guy. My Instagram is food underscore sweats. And I run a blog about kaiju and video games called controlallmonsters.com. Just all written as one word. Uh, And of course, you know, 13mgames.com and our social pages and seismictoys.com and our social pages. That's where we post the newest updates on anything Dawn of the Monsters. Very cool. Yeah, I will. uh, I'm already I'm already eyeballing that Ganera there. And I'm like, you may have to come home with me (laughs) today. (laughs) And I really, really want Temp uh, when Tempest Galahad and Aegis and agus prime i will buy those in a heartbeat <laughs> yeah those would be great my fingers are crossed for that fable dlc maybe we'll <laughs> ragnar <laughs> twisted shin godzilla stuff uh, yeah but yeah. regardless Nathan, right. where can people find you man uh you can check out all of i ha- i run a podcast empire practically at this point <laughs> i'll just mention them all really quick the monster island film vaults a podcast seeking entertainment and enlightenment through tokusatsu you get academic appreciation of kaiju and tokusatsu media and also a little bit of an audio drama there it's on all the socials you can find it on all the podcatchers it's great the you, there's also several characters who appear on the film vault that have their own Twitter account so you can go check those out as well the main hub to find links to all of these things would be monsterislandfilmvault.com I also run Henshin Men which is a podcast about the appreciation of Japanese superheroes and their high flying and high kicking adventures which I co-host with Travis Alexander and that is a television show well we get into some movies as well it's all about tokusatsu superheroes and we're currently going through our main project right now is going through the original common writer because <laughs> Travis is a massive common writer fan and there is a, I mentioned I kind of hinted up before there's a common writer reference in this game which I really appreciate <laughs> there's a bunch of them uh, as soon yes. as I saw the Evangelion colors I'm like there it is I've, yep. I've been seen once again <laughs> yep. I say this as yep. like it's one of the most popular anime properties in the planet but you know what yeah. I like it god dang it anyways yeah. <laughs> I'm Alex yeah, Cumber, basically, you can yeah, find I'm, me at foreverclassicgames.com yeah, well, I'm not done, man. I got one oh, more. you have more? <laughs> yes, the power trip. If I didn't mention the power trip, Michael would kill me. That is a, 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 the power trip, a journey through the Power Rangers franchise, which I co-host with Michael Hamilton. Going through every, We're going through Power Rangers one season at a time and doing some really deep dives, not only into the characters and the production, but also into the themes of each season. And, you know, uh, I'm also a contributing editor and writer for Kaiju Ramen Magazine. And you can check out my writing-related things on Nathan J.S. Marchand. Com. There, I got it all out of the way. <laughs> See why I bring this guy on? He is quite literally an <laughs> academic in the kaiju toku space. <laughs> I'm a real, real renaissance man. Yeah. Yes, I uh, yes, I am. Here. And if and Alex, if you ever want to come on any of my shows, let me know. No, <laughs> I absolutely. Yes, I, I love doing this stuff. So in, anytime anyone wants to have me on, I'm I'm always happy to join. Very cool. We'll have to we'll have to catch you at a con or something. And obviously, you guys can find me at foreverclassicgames.com. I'll be at PAX East this year, which I'm really excited about. So say nice. hello if you happen to be there or if you like know anybody that wants to talk to me for whatever reason. I'll be doing PR work, media work, and then just generally spreading around my resume and name. So if anybody wants to work on a project, let me know. But Alex, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. I wholeheartedly appreciate your time, and I do hope that everybody out there enjoys Dawn of the Monsters. So until next time, everybody, stay cool. We will catch you next time. Be kind to each other.